and uh, let him take it from here. And as we were uh, singing that song um, earlier, you know, Graves in the Gardens, and right now we're, we're in this middle of this conversation that we started, this, this, this series we started um, on transition. And what I love about God, one thing I love about Him is He's a God who's great at transition. We serve a God who leads us from the grave to the garden. We serve a God that leads us from mourning to dancing. He leads us from our pain into our peace. And that's one thing I love about the God that we serve. Uh, you know, that song we sang is one of my favorite songs. Especially in the midst of, of even just the season that we've been in as humanity. Is that God is a God who transitions us well. And I'm so grateful that we get to serve a God uh, like that. If you guys don't know who I am, my name is Dustin. I'm the lead pastor here. Me and my wife, we're the lead pastors here at Victory Church on the Rock. And we're so excited that you're joining us today, whether you're joining us in-house today or maybe you're joining us online. We're excited that you're with us today. Um, it's going to be, I think the series so far has been great. We have this week and the next week we're going to continue it. And one thing before, um, before we go into my, my talk today, I just want to let you guys know that we have an event coming up. Uh, on Tuesday, a ladies event. This is an awesome opportunity to get together as women. Uh, Tammy's going to be coming. She's going to be sharing a little bit of the vision of what are uh, the women's, uh, what we're going to look like in the future. It's going to be an amazing event for community, for fellowship, uh, for, for vision. It's going to be great. So all you have to do is come on Tuesday night. And when you get here, you're going to just sign in your name, put your phone number, just in case we have some sort of contact tracing. But it's going to be a great event. So come, ladies, uh, come, 7 o'clock. Uh, on Tuesday night. It's going to be great. It's going to be amazing. So I encourage all of you ladies to come. Again, I'm excited for this series. I think for all of us, we're in the midst of some sort of transition. Uh, transition in life, obviously, as we've talked about. You know, we as a church, we're in the midst of a transition. And we know, I think all of us know that transition can be very difficult. No matter what the transition is, it might be super, super challenging. Some of us, you know, again, we're in between jobs. We're trying to find work. Some of us, we've been looking for a job for a long time this year. And that's a hard transition to be stepping into. Some of us were in the transition, kind of stepping out of addiction into freedom. And that's a tough transition to get out of as well. You know, there's all sorts of things that we transition through in life. And last week, we started this, this series talking about Moses and how Moses was waiting for the new and three things that Moses did in the midst of the transition. And first thing, he, needed, he knew where he was going. He knew who was leading him. And he knew that the future was brighter than the past. And in the midst of our transitions, too, that we go through, those are three things that I think we need to start walking through, walking in. And today, uh, I want to continue uh, this series. And so the title of my talk today is that we're waiting to rebuild. We're waiting to rebuild. And one thing you need to know about me is I am probably the least handy person in this room. And like, just, I'm just being vulnerable. I am terrible at fixing things. Beth, my wife, she is the handy woman of the house. I am, I, I am so bad. Like, like uh, one time I was, when I was playing football, we, we had this field house that we would get changed in and we'd get ready for them. We'd run out. We thought we were really cool. And my coach came up to a couple of us. He said, hey, we're going to build a deck for this field house um, so that way it just looks nicer. I'm like, great. So what we did is we, we got the wood, we got the lumber, and, and, and we, he me, we measured out. This is how wide we want it to be. And me, in my brilliant mind, what I, the, the idea that I had was like, rather than measuring every time, why don't we just take the previous, the previous piece and just measure off of that? Like brilliant, brilliant idea, right? But then as we started to build this deck, we noticed um, it wasn't as wide as we in initially anticipated. It slowly, it was kind of like a xylophone, right? Where it went like wide, real low, low. And then my coach comes out, right? Because he trusted us. Not a great idea for him, but he trusted us to build this. And so he comes out. And, and the words that came out of his mouth, I won't repeat here today. Um, but he was not pleased with the work that we had produced. And I, so I am like the least handy person. So when it comes to like building things and rebuilding things, that is just not something that I'm naturally gifted in is fixing things, building things, and doing things. But there's a story in the, in the scriptures that shares this moment, this historical beautiful moment of somebody rebuilding. Somebody stepping into a, to this moment of rebuilding something that was once broken. 
and how he was waiting for this. And I have four thoughts today that kind of come out of this. Um, but so basically we're going to be reading through the story today of Nehemiah. And then maybe you don't know who Nehemiah is. Nehemiah is a guy who was a cupbearer to the king years and years and years and years ago. He was a cupbearer to the king. Basically this meant that he was in charge of making sure that the king wouldn't get poisoned. He was in charge of taking care of the wine, making sure. And you know, sometimes they would even test the wine before the king. That's a scary job. Right, because like, especially as a king in this day, like, a lot of kings people didn't like. And so Nehemiah's job was to die before the king would die. That was like literally his role. That's a great job for this guy to have. And so he has this, this job and, and he's working one day and he hears word that the, 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 the wall around the city that he's from is in shambles. He hears that, that the wall, the protection, the gate, everything is broken. It's been burned down. It's been torn down. They've been attacked and attacked and attacked. And they no, they no longer have a defense around their city. And he hears word of this. And of course, as many of us would, if we came home one day and the entire outside of our house was gone, we would not be pleased. Like if we, if we drove home and all of a sudden we can see our living room, not through a window, this is exactly what he, what he sees. He, he hears word that the wall around his city is broken and there's no more protection from outside enemies. No more protection from anything that could get in and destroy what they were doing. And he sees it in ruins. There's no protection, no hope for it. And he breaks down. He doesn't know what to do, so he starts praying. He says, God, like, I'm hearing word that this is broken. There's a broken part. And I want to be a part of rebuilding it. So he says this prayer. Then one day that he... The, the king sees he's struggling. The king comes after him and says, hey, like I'm seeing you're, you're down. And Nehemiah just starts sharing what, what's happening. He shares the, the wall around my city is broken. The wall around my city is broken. My people are unprotected. And I want to be a part of rebuilding this. And so the king says, go do it. He says, go do it. So this big ask, he goes up to the king. And he says, hey, this is what I want to do. The, the king says, yeah, you, we should go and do that and, and then so he gets permission he goes and he looks at the wall and then this is what he said Je uh, Nehemiah 2 verse 17 to 18 then I said to them you see the trouble we are in how Jerusalem lies in ruins and with its gates burned come let us reap let us build the wall of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer derision and I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. So today I have four thoughts out of the story that I think will help us as we continue to navigate transition. If you're taking notes or maybe you're watching online, maybe write this in the chat, write this in your notes. But the first thought I have is that we don't do it alone. We don't do transition alone. I think when we step into a moment of transition and we do it alone, we're, that's leading us to isolation. We're isolating ourselves. When painful moments come, when things are changing around us, a lot of us, our natural reaction is to try and go through it all by ourselves. Where we try and navigate transition alone. And, and Nehemiah, he could not rebuild this wall. He could not rebuild the most broken part of his city. We cannot rebuild the most broken parts of ourselves by ourselves. We need to get around people who will build us up, who will be there for us. Because anytime we go through transition alone, it will lead us to isolation. And isolation is a very dangerous place for us to stay. It's a very dangerous place for us to stay. It will lead us to despair. You know, when I was, when I was in high school, I worked at Canadian Tire. And there would be these big boxes in the warehouse that would say like two men lift or two person lift. I'm not going to tell you how many times I carried those boxes all by myself because I'm pretty tough. There's this one time we were in Calgary. I was, we, we used to set up like living rooms in our foyer for one of our young adults gatherings. And at the end of the night, I had forgot to ask help to bring all the couches back downstairs. So I'm looking in the foyer. I'm seeing this big job and it's all, it's just me. So guess what I did? I got all the couches downstairs all by myself. One of the worst decisions, I think my back hurt for like 13 weeks after that. I'm carrying this couch. It's like, not a love seat. It's like a big, what's bigger than a love seat? A sofa. Yeah. See, a sofa. I carried this sofa downstairs all by myself. But, but it would have been so much easier if I would have asked somebody for help. And I think a lot of us, when we're going through transition, when we're going through pain, when things are changing around us, we isolate ourselves. And when we do that, that's going to cause so much more pain 
in our life. And in the story, if we, uh, if in this, in the story, we see that he doesn't do it by himself. He says, let's go build together this wall. We, I can't do it by myself. You can't do it by yourself. So together, let's rebuild this wall. And I th- that this is what I love about the church or the local church is that it's exactly what the local church is designed for. It's designed for us to not go through life alone. We come here, we come here because we know that we cannot go through life alone. I believe that all of us, we're not Christian, we're not Christians because we have everything together. We're Christians because we're broken and we need a savior. We come together as broken individuals and we say we need a savior. And when we come together as broken people, we start to build something beautiful. Because then, this is First Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. I love this. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. You know, we come together as a church that we're going to fall. We're going to do things that we shouldn't do. We're going to do, we're going to be in moments where we can't go through it by ourselves. And we need to come together as a church and lift each other back up. To lift each other back up into the purpose and the destiny that God has for us. And we only do that together. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold threefold cord is not easily broken. When we come together... By ourselves, it's hard for us to stay strong. We can't. You know, if we want to start to rebuild the most broken parts of our soul, of our of ourselves, of our past, of our pain, we need to do it together. We can't continue to go through life alone. And right now is one of the most isolating times in 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 our lifetime. You know, we're we're in a space right now. We're getting together is harder than it's ever been and we, we, we're, we've gone through life it's been over a year and we're alone every day we, we we get up and we're working from home and we can't go out and we're not seeing our friends I want to encourage you we just because we can't see each other does not mean we need to be isolated just because we're we we can't do the things maybe that we used to do we need to know that we still have cell phones and we can call people and you know, one thing I've done in my life, I've tried to make a habit of this, is I like to FaceTime my friends and my family. Because I know that if I don't do that, it's going to lead me to isolation. Because isolation doesn't happen in a moment. It takes a little bit of time. Where we, where we stop calling people, where we stop seeing people. And slowly we get down this place where we're so isolated, we don't even know how we got there. We almost feel like how it feels, at least how I visualize it, is that we, we were going through a tunnel and we can see the light behind us and then slowly we start going forward and forward and forward and eventually we can't see light on either side. And we don't know where to go. We don't even know where to turn. But the beautiful thing is that when we come together, we can come together and we can walk through those most painful moments as a family, as a community, as a church. To walk through the most broken parts of who we are. Because not everybody will be for you, right? Right? Not everybody in this world is going to support the transition you're taking. Not everybody is going to support you stepping out of an addiction. Not everybody is going to support what you're walking through. Not everybody is going to be there for you in your most hard moment. Not everybody will be. Some people support and some people doubt. We need to build community around those who lift us up, not those who push us down. Not those who make the transition harder, but those who make the transition better. And I believe that that's our church. That's what I believe. I believe our church is, we're here for each other. When there's a brokenness in our church, I, our prayer, my prayer, is that we will be the light in this community even. When our community, when our city needs help, that they will turn to us. Because we are there for people. That when, they, that, that when somebody in our city loses a child, we will be the people who go there and we say, we're here for you. We don't even know you. That's what, I, that's what my prayer is for us. That we don't even need to know somebody before we love somebody. That's my prayer. And I, and I know that, that God has that for us, you know. Three court, a three f- court, th- 
threefold cord. <laughs> I don't know if that's a tongue twister, but right now I feel like it, it's twisting my tongue. No. <laughs> but that's my prayer. That when the most painful moments come, rather than turn and run, we pursue. Rather than running away from pain, we pursue pain together. That's my prayer for us as a church. Who do you have in your life who's fighting for you? That's a big question. I think some of us, when we look around us, we don't feel like we have anybody in our corner. We don't feel like we have anybody supporting us, there for us. We don't feel like we have a, a group of people around us. And I want to encourage you, let's get connected here at our church. And this is where we find that tight bond. That's where we find this cord when we come together as a church. You know, Nehemiah 2 verse 19. There's a lot of names in here. I'm not positive I'm going to say them right, but I'm going to try my best. But Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant of Geshem the Arab heard of it. They jeered at us. And by hear of it, they said they, they had found out that, that, that they were trying to rebuild this wall around Jerusalem. They jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? What's interesting when, when I read this is that people began to doubt Nehemiah. People began to doubt his intention. People began to doubt his heart. People began to doubt. They said, are you just rebelling against the king that you're rebuilding this wall? That's not why Nehemiah was trying to rebuild this wall. He wasn't rebelling against anybody. He was serving his savior. And he said, let's rebuild this. So, so, and then in Nehemiah 4, 1 to 3, we're going to see more doubt. Now when Shanbalit heard that they were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and, in the ar and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? And Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, it will break down their stone wall. My thought today, my second thought today, write this down, write it in the chat is this, there will be doubters. Any transition we go through, any change we try and make in our life for the positive, there will be people who doubt us. There will be people who doubt your intention. There will be people who doubt your heart. There will be people who doubt, why are you even doing this? I don't even think you are capable of doing this. You know, when, when some of us, maybe we've transitioned from working and we started a business. I'm telling you, if you do that, there's going to be a lot of people who doubt you. There's going to be a lot of people who look at you and say, I don't, I don't think you should do that. That doesn't seem wise. That doesn't seem like the best thing for you to do. There's going to be always people who doubt your intention. There's always going to be people who doubt your God even. You know, in my life, I've, I've a lot of transitions. And, and, and every time there's people who doubted me. Even Beth and I, you know, when we, when we stepped out of our old church, when we resigned, I had a lot of friends and family, even within the church, who said, I don't think you should do that. I don't think it's wise. You literally just had a baby. You, you, you literally just bought a house. Why? would you do this? They, they doubted it. And the thing that I stepped foot in is when doubt comes, I need to step closer to Jesus. Because if Jesus is speaking, that's the voice we need to listen to. Not the voices around us. There's a lot of voices in our world, right? Whew. I'm telling you, there's so many voices in our world. And we need to, to navigate the noise and hone in on the voice. The one who's speaking. And we need to hold on to the promise. I believe that when God speaks to us, maybe what the future is going to look like, there's a promise in that. We need to hold on to that promise. This is going to happen. I'm sure, right, Nehemiah, he sees a broken wall around his city, and he thinks, I can't do this. I mean, that's the reality. He couldn't do it. But what's beautiful is when he got the, the team together, when he rallied his crew, when they got the, everybody together, they were able to rebuild these walls. Because God had spoken, this is what's going to happen. And they focused on that voice, not the voice of those around him. There will always be people who doubt us. Nehemiah had so many doubters. You know, I'm a big, I'm a big sports fan. Something I just like, I highly value is sports. My favorite team, and then uh, my favorite sport is, is football. My, my favorite team is the New England Patriots in the NFL. 
And there's this one player that's my favorite player. His name is Julian Edelman. I don't know if anyone knows Julian Edelman. He's my favorite player, played for the Patriots. He just retired. And you know, when he got drafted, he, he was drafted at a different position than he actually ended up playing at when he was playing sports. He was drafted as a quarterback. And, he, and when he got drafted, he tra- changed positions to wide receiver. And there were so many people who said, you can't do it. Like the, they said, you're not going to make it in, the fo- in national football. There's people who told him, like, you, you're not going to be able to do this. Uh, you're not good enough. You're not talented enough. You're not strong enough. And, 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 and what's beautiful about him is, is, is he stepped out, out of those voices and he ended up becoming the, the most valuable player of the Super Bowl one season at a different position. And, and, you know, he did this in sports. And I believe we can do this because we follow Jesus. This is so much bigger than sports. This is so much bigger than our pain. So much bigger. We need to step past the voice of the doubters and step into the voice of our God. And say, God, we trust you. I trust you in the middle of this transition. I trust you with all that I am. I trust you to lead me through this transition. Whose voice is more important, theirs or God's? And we have this opportunity to say, who are we going to prove right? Are we going to prove God right? Or are we going to prove them right? Nehemiah could have given up. And I think a lot of us were in this moment where we're in the midst of the transition we're in, we feel like we just want to give up. We feel like we want to just throw in the towel and say, I'm done. Like, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm telling you, we can't give up. We can't give up in the middle of the toughest moments. If you want to give up, give up after you win. Never quit in the middle of the most painful moment. Quit when you get the victory. That's a better place to step out. Don't step out in the pain because God's growing us through the pain, through the hard moment, through the transition. God is growing us. We prove them right because when God is leading us in our transition, nothing can stop us. Nothing doesn't matter what the enemy tries to throw our way. Nothing can stop us. And then, you know, if we continue this story, these people stopped doubting and they started attacking. And sometimes people in our life transition from doubters to attackers. People who don't just doubt us, they actually start attacking the very character of who we are. They start actually attacking the most vulnerable part in Nehemiah 4 verse 16 to 18. It says, from that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held the weapon in the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. You know, the, the third thought I have today is this, is that we're all multitaskers. We're all multitaskers in the midst of transition. We fight to rebuild and we build and fight at the exact same time. We, feel, we build and we fight at the exact same time. Some of us, God has given us a vision for our life. God has given us a dream for our life and we're building it as hard as we can. But at the same time, we're still trying to defend what God is building. We're still trying to defend because the enemy's trying to attack. The, the enemy's trying to tear it down. The enemy's trying to, to tear down the very, the very nature, the very core of who we are. And we need, to, we need to fight that as well as build at the same time. And this is so challenging. You know, they had a hammer in one hand, they're building, and they're fighting in the other hand at the same time. Trying to build, trying to fight. Trying to build and trying to fight. Healing comes at a cost. I think this is just the reality f- for us is that healing sometimes comes at a cost. Sometimes it costs relationships. Sometimes it costs finances. Sometimes it costs uh, friendships. Sometimes it costs. Healing can cost. Because when we're fighting, say for us, we're fighting to forgive. Maybe we're transitioning and we're trying to forgive something from our past. We're trying to forgive somebody in our life. Forgiveness can sometimes come at a cost. You know? Jesus forgave us, but it didn't come for free. It came at a cost. And sometimes whatever we're transitioning out of, it comes at a cost to where we're going because what we invest in grows and what we neglect shrinks. 
So what are we investing in right now? What, are you in, what relationships are you investing in? What are you investing in in your life? What are you investing? Because God wants to take what we invest. He wants to take the time that we put in. He wants to take it, and he's going to grow that in us. When we invest in the right thing. When we invest in him rather than in, in the things of this world. Invest in him as we transition. We need to know that we need to invest in our future, not invest in our past. Where are we going? That's where God wants us to do. Investing in yourself is not selfish. I think some of us, we, we've been, at least me, I've been taught, like sometimes investing in yourself can be selfish because we need to be investing in other people, which of course we need to invest in other people. But we can't invest in other people if we don't grow ourselves. If we don't actually invest in ourselves, that's when we actually find the fruit. That's when we actually find the, the strength, the courage that we need to continue to fight, to continue to build, to continue in this transition. You know, Nehemiah 6, 15 to 16. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul. In 52 days, they rebuilt the wall. And when our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and felt greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. You know, my last thought today, I think this is maybe the most important thought, is that our victory intimidates the enemy. I'm telling you, when Jesus walked out of that grave, the enemy was shaken in his boots. When we actually finish the rebuilding part of who we are, the enemy is shaking. It intimidates him. The enemies of Nehemiah, the enemies of Jerusalem were standing there like, how did they do this? How did they transition? How did they rebuild this wall? How did they do that? And they're shaking in their boots. Their esteem fell. Their esteem fell. The, our victory intimidates the enemy. When, 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 when God transitions us from the grave to the garden, the enemy's not pleased. It intimidates him. When we're in the midst of the most painful season that we've ever had and we're still dancing, that intimidates the enemy. And we need to realize this, that our victory intimidates the enemy. When was the last time I had a victory in my life? You know, Dave Ramsey, I don't know if you guys know Dave Ramsey, Dave Ramsey he's this big financial guy, talks about paying off debt. One thing that he says, I was listening to this podcast, he said, what he always encourages people to do with lots of debt he said, pay off the smallest debt first. And for some of us, we're like, pay off the smallest debt first. Like, why would we do that? Like, why? Like, there's more interest on the bigger debts. He says, pay off the smallest debt first. Why? Because then we have a small victory. I paid this off. I can do more. When was the last time you had a victory in your life? Because every time we have a victory, the enemy shrinks. Every time we have a victory, the enemy takes a step back and he starts to question his tactics. We need to realize our victory intimidates the enemy. We need to be striving for victory after victory. When we have one in the past, we keep moving forward. We don't live in our past victory. We get excited about our future victory. And we need to step more into that future. Our victory intimidates the enemy because we've already won the battle. When we step out of the grave, we're moving forward. We're not going back into the grave. We're going back into the garden, stepping into the fruit, stepping into the future. Because God puts courage in us. He encourages us. And I love that word encourage because encourage means literally put courage into somebody. How does God do that? By bringing victory in our life. And he does that. God is a God of victory. He's not a God of defeat. I think a lot of the time our mindset as Christians is that we serve a God of defeat because we've seen so much pain, so much agony, so much fear in our life. But we need to step out of God's not defeated. He's won. He's the God of victory. He's the God of victory. And that's beautiful because we have God in us. And when we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, when we walk in the power that God gives us, nothing can stop us. No victory is too big. No addiction is too big. No transition, no change is too big because we serve a God who's already won. Our victory intimidates the enemy. Some, sometimes a small victory can put enough courage inside of us that we can win the entire battle, the entire war. You know, when we step out, we win a battle. I stepped out of one thing. That gives us courage. We can win the next battle. 
and the next battle and the next battle until we win the war. That's the God we serve. You know, Romans 12 verse 2, this is what it says. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, God's will for your life, the transition you're going through may be hard, but God's leading you somewhere good and somewhere perfect. That's the will. That's the will of the Father. And how this comes is by renewal, by rebuilding. This comes by renewing the way we think, changing the way we think, renewing the most broken part, rebuilding the most broken parts of our soul. We need to rebuild ourselves. We need to renew ourselves. We need to refill ourselves. Only then can we refuel this world. The world is waiting for a refueling. The world is waiting for what you have. The world is waiting for what's inside of you. That's what the world is waiting for. And if we don't refill ourselves, if we don't refuel ourselves, we're never going to be able to bring that to this world that desperately needs it. You know, Beth and I, we were driving here in Edmonton. Uh, we went to the zoo on uh, Friday. And as I'm driving through Edmonton, I'm just, I'm just thinking and I'm thinking like, God, like this city needs you. Like this, this city like desperately needs Jesus. As much as we do, as much as I desperately need Jesus, this world does too. This world needs Jesus. The city, our communities, our families need Jesus now, I think, more than ever. Like we, we as a humanity are just, I feel like, just so broken right now. We're so divided. You know, and sometimes our division gets in the way of our love. And right now, my, my prayer for me, and I'm just saying this for me, is that I'm praying that God will renew the way that I think. Say, God, I need a new way of thinking. Because the way that we're thinking in our world right now is obviously not working. And I'm just praying, God, like, renew me. Renew my mind. You know, it's beautiful. And one thing about Nehemiah that I found so interesting is that Nehemiah hears of the pain before he sees the pain. And it's interesting, if you read through the story, and I would encourage you to read through Nehemiah maybe this week. I read through it this week. It's so powerful. But God doesn't actually come right out and say, rebuild the wall. Right? He, he hears of the wall, and then Nehemiah gets on his knees and starts praying and starts fasting. Sometimes we're waiting for an assignment. We're waiting to see where God wants to lead us, but the problem is already right in front of us. Nehemiah didn't get a message from a burning bush like Moses did. Nehemiah saw pain, prayed about it, and then pursued it. And I think it's the same for us. When we're looking for our purpose right now, like what are we supposed to do as believers? Go towards the pain. Go towards the pain. I know if the pain is not comfortable, right? Like it's not. Like pain is the least comfortable place for us to be. But that's the place that Jesus always would go. He would pursue people's desperate need. And so for us, I believe as believers right now, and I'm not just talking to me, I'm, I'm not just talking to our church, I just believe globally, we should be pursuing people's pain. As uncomfortable as that is, our city needs something. We need to stop running away from pain because our purpose is found in the pain around us. We can't run away from pain. We need to pursue it and bring Jesus into it. You know, that, that's, you know I think as, as we start stepping out of COVID, I believe this is what God is speaking, at least to me, for even for us as a church, is how are we pursuing the pain of the world? And maybe the transition we're going through as individuals, as a church, is because God is leading us into this moment of saying, okay, let's pursue people. Let's pursue people. And again, I don't know your transition. I don't know what you're walking through, but I believe this is God's heart for us because Jesus is rebuilding us. He's rebuilding us. And through this, this, through this past year, God has been rebuilding all of us. I don't think we're the same people that we were a year and a half ago. I'm not. And I'm grateful. 
I'm grateful that I'm not the same as I was because I know God is something bigger for us, bigger for me, more beautiful for all of us. God is a God that leads and serves us, and I love that we serve a God who leads us, but he doesn't just lead us, he serves us. You know, I just want to uh, pray for us today, and then we're going to sing that song, Graves in the Gardens, one more time. I just want to encourage you to stand with us, maybe wherever you're at. Stand if you're at home. You know, I, I know transition is hard. I know that. Like, I am aware it's hard. But I believe that God wants to lead us through this transition well as individuals, as a church. And so, Father, I just pray for everybody who's hearing my voice right now. God, I pray for peace in the midst of our pain. I pray for peace in the midst of our transition. I pray for peace in the midst of what we go through. And God, I pray that today you start to reveal to us the pain in our own life. You start to reveal to us the pain in our city. You start to reveal to us the pain in our province, in our country. And God, I pray that we will have the courage, that we will see the victories, and we will start to pursue the pain as you did. God, I pray that we will go where you lead us, not where we lead us. God, I thank you that you are leading us somewhere beautiful today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this song with the team.